All right. Happy Wednesday to you guys. We are live streaming early today because I wanted to have Eric from Odyssey Labs on our live stream to talk about all the great new features of version 1.5. How you doing, Eric? Good. How about you? I'm doing awesome. You know, it's the, it's a beautiful day out. It's not raining finally here, so I'm happy. Um, so I was just, you know, we were just talking offline and I, I was telling you about how I have this long history with Odyssey. I've been following what you guys have been doing on the consumer side since before around 2005. And incidentally, I'm wondering, since you're pretty new to the company, you've only been what, for about a year at Odyssey? Yeah. Do you know the first product that actually had Odyssey built into it for the consumer grade? I don't. It was the Denon 5805. And uh, at the time <laughs> of the review, that, that was a massive 100 pound receiver, still to this day, my favorite AVR ever made. And at the time, the um, I found a bug in, in Odyssey. It wasn't doing anything for the subwoofer channel. Literally wasn't calibrating it. And that's when you know Japan got involved. And that's when I met Chris Kiriakakis, who was one of the founders of Odyssey. And he actually flew down and brought one of your separate Odyssey boxes. You guys used to have an eight-channel um, Pro box. I forgot what it was called, like the Pro Kit or something like that. And it came with this, this mic calibration kit. Yep. Which is an awesome kit, by the way. Um, so, anyways, yeah, we've been setting, we've been playing around with that since 2005, and I've been giving him input on things I like to see. And you guys have been really great at executing updates and trying to keep current and trying to give calibrators more tools in their bag of tricks to get a better calibration for their clients, especially handling multi sub management, which I think is really critical for any type of serious calibration because you know you should have at least two subwoofers in every home theater system. Well, yeah. I mean, if you can afford it, you know, I, I guess not everybody or, or has the space for it or whatever, but yes. You have to make the, you have to make the space because base is key. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's my viewpoint anyways. So I wanted to have you on to talk about, uh, you guys have a recent update to the Odyssey uh, Multi-Q X PC software version 1.5. And I'm about to do a calibration, actually. I've got the Marantz AV10 I just did some bench testing on. I'm going to do a full calibration. I'm going to do a YouTube video on, on my results. And I wanted to go over all these new features with you because I don't even understand all of the new features. I haven't really took a deep dive yet. So that's why I think it's important to have someone on from Odyssey to give us kind of a tutorial. So yeah. I'm going to share the screen here, and then I'll just kind of let you go into the driver's seat. Yeah, and one of the, just to touch quickly on something you said, one of the advantages of having most people, well, and some people may not realize that um, with the apps, both the Android and iOS app and, and this Windows app, um, the calculations are done in the app, not on the AVR. And really all that the AVR is doing is running the filters. And so by separating the calculations from the real-time aspect, we're able to do things like provide updates a lot more quickly. You know, the development life cycle for an AVR yeah. um, is quite large, years usually. And um, so, uh, you know, here we are with 1.5 with what I think is, um, you know, they're not huge uh, updates, but I think they're pretty important and they are um, going to make a lot of people's systems sound better. And I can already see in the comments, I'm looking on the right side of the yeah. screen, if somebody is yep exactly yeah so um we're going to talk about that today and uh hopefully people who already know about it like aaron here um can uh learn a little bit more or perhaps ask more questions um but uh let's just uh, go ahead and dive right in so i'm going to start using the app uh gene yep and um so now just so people know that you have to download the PC app, there's a fee for it. Um, I forgot what the fee is. Is it like 200, 250, something like Two, that? 200 per AVR, correct. Yeah. And, and that's you, can't, you can't transfer that. If someone buys your AVR, is it transferable or no? Well, I mean, it's, you know, it, I don't think that there's really an official policy on it right now. Um, in the past, we've said no, but um, it kind of depends on how long you've used it and stuff like that. So we'll, we'll handle it on a case by case basis. I got you. The best answer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, people can feel free to contact us about that. 
Okay. Um, so we'll start by just using the sample measurements because um, it'll get a little bit messy if we try to actually use an AVR right now, too many windows and so forth. So um, we're going to go to the uh, measure page and all we're doing is just um, pretending that we've just measured the room, just one measure. Yeah. I think uh, most of your viewers probably know about this uh, aspect of it. Um, and then we can really go in and dive into the 1.5 features. So I've, I've, having given this presentation a couple times, I kind of think that I want to go about the order of explaining it a little bit differently, perhaps a little bit more intuitively. So what we're going to start with is by going into the settings menu here. And um, 1.5 has introduced this feature down here called EQ Headroom Expansion. So uh, what uh, the engineers have been able to do is steal some of the headroom away from the trims on the AVR and use that to allow the user to do more EQ than they could before. And this is mm -hmm. kind of like I said, it's a small change, but also a big change because the entire history of Odyssey, I believe they've limited the filtering on the upside to nine decibels. And recently we just said, well, look, we have the app here. The app, you know, is so much, it's such a better UI than the NAVR calibration. Let's just give the users the option to do this, you know, and allow them to understand that there may be some negative consequences, but on the whole, they're going to be positive. And, uh, you know, just putting that control back into the user's hands. So, uh, well, I could tell you this much when I did the AVP, the Denon AVP Odyssey calibration years ago, I'm talking like 2007. I noticed when I ran the calibration and I and I did a reference disc, like the Dolby had a, a, a reference disc for True HD, um, I ran out of headroom in terms of master volume. Like I could not get the system loud enough. Yes. That, that was a big problem back then. So the fact that you're adding this now to get some of that headroom back, and part of that was because it was doing a lot of boost and you were trying to not overload any of the channel trims or, or any of the uh, preamp or anything like that. So this is a pretty cool feature. The other thing I was going to ask you, is there a I way? Should, I should interrupt you right there and say there is a, that caveat still exists for this feature. So you, it is possible and it really depends on your specific configuration that the master volume will be somewhat limited depending yeah. upon how much correction you do, how high you're turning the volume, you know, what, what exactly the filter is for your speaker. So there is that. Um, I think that prob I mean, I don't know how many people are out there listening at zero. You know what I mean? Um, pro I would guess that most people aren't. And if you aren't, then this is a great feature for you, probably. If you mm -hmm. are, I don't know. It's it's, it's really, you're going to have to play with it and see how it goes, you know? Yeah, we got a user here that loves the new features that deep dive and it works really well. That's awesome. Cool. Okay. So um, let's not enable this feature right now. And what I want to do is go to the uh, filter settings page and we can look at, um, as an example, the subwoofer. So this is a, I mean, I honestly don't know where this measurement came from. I think probably somebody, maybe Jeff or something measured the room and just kind of stuck it in the app as the default measurement. But it's a little bit all over the place and you can see the the orange line here is the result it's still not a very flat line yeah so you with the default um i can enlarge this window with the default setting you can see here um i'm tracing the mouse across the 9 db line so yeah. you can see that's where it's limiting the the purple line representing the filter um is limited to that value right there so basically just not able to do enough to make the final calibration flat like probably a lot of people would want or expect it to be you know um so if we go now back to the settings menu and i'm gonna enable that feature and there is this warning um because this feature is basically going to especially if you don't um, enable the next checkbox, which we can look at in a sec called maintain relative trims, because it's stealing some of the headroom away from the trims on a speaker by speaker basis. If you turn Odyssey off, your, your speakers are not going to be calibrated to each other. So that's just something to keep in mind. If you're somebody who um, is often turning Odyssey on and off as part of your 
daily usage, which I'm, I'm not that person. I always leave Odyssey on. But if you are, you're going to want to check the maintain relative trims box. And that is going to make sure that when you turn Odyssey off, all your trims are still relatively correct to each other for the speakers. <clears throat> I'll leave where's that way. where's that option to maintain right oh here. i see it i see it okay yeah. so we'll leave that off for now just to do some exploring and then we can come back and see what difference it makes mm -hmm. um so because denon and marantz give you negative 12 to 12 as the trim sort of headroom for your speakers the expansion limit is therefore exactly 24. so if i type in 40 run it into 24. that's as high as it goes um do you always necessarily have 24 extra db of filtering available to you no you don't it is completely dependent upon the speaker and uh, uh, dependent upon the filter that odyssey calculates for you so we're, we'll go look and, and see how that affects things but for now we're going to leave it at the maximum which is 24 and we're going to go back to this page and you can see that um my initial impression about looking at this graph is that the orange line is a lot flatter. So that's the results that most people are, can expect. Now, unfortunately, this speaker just has some <laughs> issues, the subwoofer, the sample one um, that was included in the app. So it's not fully able to correct all the problems, but I would say that it's much better than it was before. And so that's basically the, uh, um, the result that you're going to expect to get. This peak right here is about 20 so we're still not using the full limit um but it just doesn't have the resolution at the low frequencies to correct for these little blips because the resolution is about three hertz um, yeah low that's a very high q uh bump yeah exactly but um so just keep that in your mind we'll go back again and um just to compare it to where it was before And again, you can see, I think most people would probably say that it looks better as a result. Mm -hmm. Now, where it really comes into um, play is with the other important new feature in 1.5. And we're going to see that if we go to the design target curve page. So I'm going to enlarge my window a little bit. OK, so this new checkbox at the bottom that some of your users have already some of your viewers have already commented on is called disable auto leveling so one thing that i i, I really need to say up front here is that um there have been some historical complaints about odyssey not having enough base and so forth right yep. um, that's that's on the forums if you go look um and uh the solution for that has been this feature that Odyssey has had called Dynamic EQ. And Dynamic EQ is uh, intended to increase the bass at uh, lower volume levels to compensate for what's kind of traditionally known as uh, the way that your brain has a different response to those frequencies at different volume levels um, from these curves that this guy researched called the Fletcher Munson curves. Yep. Sure you about that. Um, so if you're somebody who likes um, dynamic EQ and you like the way it sounds, then don't pay attention to what I'm about to say, because I think that that's probably the best solution for you. It's probably the best solution for most people. Um, but the reason that I personally, so since I'm new at Odyssey, I get to say that I don't fully like dynamic EQ. And the reason is the not the bass, but actually the highs, because it also boosts the highs. Yep. And I, I don't know why I have very sensitive hearing up there. And to me, it's just, it's too, it sounds too tinny. It actually causes me some pain. Um, That's but, good. You have good hearing. So be proud of that. <laughs> yeah. And there's, a, I think there's a secondary thing as well, which is that um, my career actually started out kind of more in the recording industry. And um, when you're sitting in front of the console, you know, you're listening to, different how your music sounds on different speakers you're listening mm. on the small speakers you're listening on the big speakers and so i think that i and perhaps other people who have that kind of a background are more trained to ignore or internally compensate for the frequency differences at the different volume levels so to me it actually sounds unnatural for the system to boost the bass 
at uh, low and the treble at low volume levels. That sounds kind of disconcerting uh, to me. So, but all that being said, I still like a little bit more bass than the standard calibration gives. And um, you well, know, yeah, I mean, it's important to note that you don't want flat down to 20 hertz. You want a gradual rise in bass at lower yeah. frequencies. And right. I, I found over the 20 years of calibrating rooms, I like about a 10, a rat, gradual rise of about 10 dB of boost down to 20 hertz compared to like 20 kilohertz. Yeah. So it's a, it's a gradually tilted, but you want it, you want to control the resonances of course, but you want a gradual rise in yeah. bass. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That's all, everything you said is correct. So, um, so yeah, so, so traditionally that's been what dynamic EQ does. I just don't like dynamic EQ. I was one of the people who pushed for this feature at Odyssey because I thought let's just offer the, a different solution that I think is going to appeal to some of the people out there, you know, um, and why not if we can do it. Right. So, so if you disable auto leveling, dynamic EQ is, is unchecked at that point, right? It's not enabled. No, it's completely, it's completely independent of dynamic EQ. So you can still have it on or off. I probably oh, okay. Okay. I probably wouldn't, but you know that yeah, they're not connected to each other in any. I way. gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, in the internal, um, this is this is where I think a lot of people have gotten hung up on Odyssey not having enough bass. In the internal AVR calibration, and even in the um, Android app, so and, and the iOS app, you know, in, in that app you have the uh, curve editor that you can drag with your fingers, right? I'm sure you, you've used that gene. Yep. Um, and what I think people don't realize it's doing is that we're always taking kind of an average across the spectrum of the volume because we want to make sure that the overall speaker is calibrated to reference level. And so basically what that means is um, for main speakers, the range of 500 to 2000 hertz um, is the critical kind of perceptual range where people perceive loudness. Mm -hmm. And so we want to make sure that that range is kind of always at the same volume. And that's how Odyssey really decides on the trim level for any particular speaker. Um, the problem with that, especially in the iOS and Android app, is that if you were to add a filter that affects that range, like let's say, so I'm just going to do an example here. Um, we're going to add a new uh, parametric EQ filter, and you can see that it's, in fact, centered exactly at that range, so centered at 1K, and I'm going to pull it up. Now, do you notice what, let me scroll, you can see it on the surround, but I'm going to scroll over to the front to make it more obvious in the center. Look at what's happening to the front and center graphs as oh, I yeah. drag, you see what I'm saying? So. What I think a lot of people don't realize is happening is that because it's calibrating to that frequency range, you can see when I drag it that it's almost kind of like there's an anchor point at 1K, right? Yeah. And so instead of what you think it's doing, which is boosting at 1K, it's actually keeping 1K at a certain exact level. Lowering everything and else. Dropping everything else. Yeah, exactly. So that what what people don't realize is that that is how odyssey has behaved the entire time that it has existed so all odyssey speaker calibrations are doing that exact thing so people think oh i just i want to hear the vocals a little bit more i want to boost at 1k well you actually just kind of dropped the rest of your range is what you actually did and that may not maybe that doesn't matter if it affects all the main speakers but the particular problem you've introduced is that now the 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 area down here is not going to line up perfectly with the, the crossover to your subs, right? So sure. you basically created a kind of a stair step at the at the intended crossover point, and that's that's a real problem. I mean, you know, you want a calibration. Well, you're not really getting a properly calibrated system if you do it that way. The problem is even more obvious um, if we uh, so let's get rid of this one and add a new one that uh, does something like this. So th a lot of people are going to do this, right? This is what they, this is exactly what you were just describing. They exactly. just want a nice gradual um, uh, rise in base. Rise, uh, yeah. As you approach the lower frequencies. Well, let's go over to the subwoofer graph. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to dra drag it again from, from zero. Look at what's happening to the subwoofer graph. You think you're boosting at 50? Well, look what's happening at 100. It's going below zero, yeah. right? 
So you're just basically level shifting. Ex exactly. So you you've now affected again the, the where you think that the crossover point is going to be from your mains to your subwoofer. Um, so that's I think people you know have been going in particular particularly to the uh, Android and iOS app and saying oh, I'm going to drag my finger up here a little bit more bass in the subwoofer. Nope. You actually just lowered the base above the calibration point, which for subwoofers is 30 to 80 hertz. So starting at around 50 hertz, you're actually lowering the base if you drag a, a low shelf to you know towards 20 hertz. Um, yeah, so there's Aaron. Um, so the disable auto leveling is just you know gonna get rid of that. So watch the subwoofer graph as I check that. Oh yeah, I guess we should. So, you know, you, we you have to understand that since you're um, doing this, you're not going to have an officially calibrated system anymore, right? It's because you're not your your subs are not exactly at reference level, and uh, you know, just so you you might have to be aware of um, boosting extra than you were before. You know, pay attention. I don't think anybody's going to really have a problem with it. It's just kind of something that we legally have to sure. say, right? Um, but, um, yeah, so again, toggling that checkbox it's on and off. That's what you would expect. That's what everybody is expecting. This is what they've been getting. So kind of fixes a huge problem in my opinion. Right. I mean, so you need to, you need to enable, or you need to disable auto level, but also it, uh, check that other box that gives you more headroom, right. Since you're doing well, this. Yeah. They so work together. Correct. So the reason that I wanted to talk about the EQ expansion first is because that's going to benefit you even if you don't use the disabling of the auto leveling. It's probably just going to make your calibration smoother than it was before. Mm -hmm. But particularly because of the fact that now you're causing the filters to maybe go much higher than they were before, you need that extra headroom in order to make those filters reach as high as you want them to reach, right? So previously, with 9 dB only, we might not have been able to reach, uh, let's say, I mean, you know, I don't know who's going to put it up to 20, but you, you would <laughs> not have been done able to do that. We have a guy on our channel that likes his base really hot. So he would yeah. definitely be up there. Um, and uh, what we can do is uh, go back to the uh, filter settings page and toggle the, uh, so, okay, right. So it's, it's off right now, right? So, I mean, there's nothing happening down here that is useful because it's just not, there's not enough filtering to um, follow that line. You can see the line kind of is going nicely here, right? Yeah. But then once it gets down here, it's just like, I don't have that, right? Because again, the purple line representing the maximum that's available can't go above nine. Yeah. So if we go back into the settings page, um, we'll turn that on. And, you know, that's a much nicer line, right? Yep. So that's kind of the calibration that I think people are have been hoping to get, but weren't able to, you know. Um, and uh, how low in frequency does Odyssey actually correct to? Does it stop at twenty, or is it actually going down to ten hertz? No, I think it will go down to ten. I, I can't so, remember. I, I would have to ask. The mics there. usually tend to not have a good noise floor below twenty hertz. You know, yeah. so it's really dicey. I think most mics. I think it's 10, um, but uh, uh, I'll, yeah, I, we can uh, check later and post in the comments. Okay. So what else do I want to go over here? Um, yeah, so you, you probably are going to want to do some listening tests um, if you're going to do crazy amounts of filtering like that, um, you know, not go all the way immediately to master volume um, and just make sure that your speakers are behaving um, if you're going to do that kind of uh, adjustment. You know. Now, when you make these adjustments, you have to go and import it back into the AVR. Can you leave the software open, do your listening, and then go make changes and then re-import? You have to re-import every time you make a change. It's not real time. If I make a filter change, it's not instantly doing it to the AVR, right? Correct. But I mean, it's it's uh, you, you can save the project or you can leave the project open. You go to the... Um, finalize page. <clears throat> this is the button that does the magic, transfers the filters to the AVR. Now you can listen to it. You don't like it. All you have to do is go back here, mm -hmm. make your change, and then come back here and transfer the filters again. So important to note, before you transfer filters, 
turn off the low frequency containment because you're going to kill all your high, your your very deep base that you've been trying to boost. I'm surprised that that's enabled by default. I don't know why it's enabled right now. I never have it enabled. So uh, it might have been I was just playing around and forgot to kind of reset it. Here's another good Aaron's kicking butt here, man. You should be on the show with us when exporting. Don't forget to save. Oh, yeah. Ask me how I know. <laughs> Where do you do the save uh, process? Just in the file menu right here. Oh, okay. So that so in case your computer crashes or anything like that, you don't want to lose your work, right? Is that that I guess that's why he's saying that. Well, no, not just crashing, but you once you've saved the project, you now have your exact AVR configuration right there. And you let's say three weeks from now, you're like, you know what? I actually want one DB more of base. You recall it. Load it up, yeah. add that DB and transfer the filters again. So if you close out the program, does it ask you to save it before you close it out? Well, there's also this option up here called auto save, um, which is probably a good thing for most people to do. But yes, it will ask you to save the project. Okay. To exit. Yeah. So, yeah, that's I kind of expected to talk for that stuff, uh, talk about that stuff for about half an hour, and that seems to be where we're at. So, um, if you have any so what happens now if <laughs> let's say you have that subwoofer curve? I want to talk about how we could go in with a fine tooth comb and maybe add manual. PEQ filters using the yeah. bi-quad feature. Can you show that? Can you Absolutely. give a demonstration on how that works? I mean, it's so simple. Um, what's that expression? Even a, I don't know. I'm not going to go there. Yeah, so it's really just a matter of uh, either dragging or typing in the uh, frequency exactly. I mean, but does it show you the actual subwoofer calibration results so you could go in and do that? Yes, if you go back, so now that I've added this, I mean, this is kind of, let, let me drag it down here so that you can see it in the subwoofer. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's gonna be a kind of a weird graph, but but it will definitely show it, you know? So there's, there, there's that dip right there, right? Well, Oops. I was actually thinking, can you overlay the calibration and then make your changes real time to see what you, like you see that big peak at 60 Hertz? I yes. want to see that graph in that manual PEQ mode, so I could go in and kind of. Oh, you want to you want to overlay this graph yeah. on the target? Yeah. So we we're working on that feature, but we don't have that right now. But yeah, okay. so you, unfortunately, you have to flip back and forth between this page and the other one. So what I would recommend to people is take a picture with your phone on this graph, and then go in and do your manual PEQ. You could calculate the Q if you do if you look at the center frequency. Let's say that's sixty hertz. And let's say it's 10 hertz wide, it's 60 divided by 10. So your Q would be six. You can yeah, manually I mean, enter Q. You can manually you can, enter Q, right? If you, if people don't, uh, might, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe people don't know that you can double click on the graph and it gets big like this. And um, then you can, I mean, it's pretty, pretty precise. I can see that that peak right there is at about 75. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, you just, you can literally go back and type that in. Yeah, let's look at that again. Yeah, so you do have the ability to add the key, to change the cue as well. Yeah. You could put yep. that at six or whatever. I want like a really sharp cue, ten. You know, I don't remember what the limit is. Yep. You can make it a basically a notch filter if you want. Sure. Now, uh, you know, a question I have for you on this reference curve um, with the two kilohertz dip. We want to, in most cases, I actually want to disable that because. Yeah. I think speakers have been designed a lot better now and you don't need that. Um, so should the user go to the flat curve when they're doing all this and just uncheck reference? Um, to get rid of the mid-range compensation? No, no, that's not how it works. The mid-range compensation is a filter that's just one of any types of, so like I could even add another, I'm not sure why you'd want to do this, but you can add a mid-range compensation filter here. You can literally add another one. I mean, that's kind of silly because now you have two mid-range compensations being summed yeah. together, but it's just as simple as I don't want mid-range compensation on any of my calibrations. Just get rid oh, of it. Gone. Yeah. So even when you go back to reference curve, it'll be gone as well? Yeah, because we're applying this to reference and flat. So uh, it's I've removed it from both of them. There's, there's no, once the filter doesn't exist in, in this menu, it's gone from all, you know, calibration. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so let like, me ask you this now, if you, um, let's say you have two rows of seats. Yes. Now, obviously when you run any room calibration system, it's always going to pick one main listening position to, to calculate your delays and your levels. 
I sometimes do a best fit between the two rows. Like I'll have my perfect setting obviously for MLP, but if I want to have like a best fit between the front row and back row, um, is there a way that you can average two calibrations? If you put the mic in two different, two, two different main listening positions, a front row and a back row, is there a way to average the level and delay so you get kind of a best fit for both areas or do, would you just have a separate calibration for the back row at that point? Well, I mean, the way you do a, an average calibration for a big room like that is just to measure multiple positions. Then they automatically get averaged together. Um, but it's still picking the delays and levels for that one seat. It always. is. Yes, you're correct. Um, I mean, that's why it's best to do the measurements kind of in a circle around the main listening position, because that is going to give you the exact average that you're looking for. And I have had many conversations with my colleagues about like, what, what really are we looking for when we're talking about the positions that we want to measure? So you could absolutely make the argument that if you're the only person in the room, if the, like you, you want to have a preset just for you, you only should take one measurement or maybe take two measurements, you know, at each of your ear positions. Yeah, six inches like apart. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, this is like kind of the more of the art side of things than the science, you know, because like, you know, even Duroc will let you say, what, what's your, what do you going for in this particular calibration do you want it to be spread out on your sofa is it yeah. really just for your lazy boy you know like what 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 do you so there's I, i'm gonna again be a little bit of an odyssey heretic when i say um there is no hard and fast rule about what positions you should measure it's just about what's the most sensible thing for the use cases that you're going to be doing in your you know listening environment or if you're listening with family if, if it's always you and the wife and the kids, then, you know, maybe one position for each of where they normally sit, I mean, might be sufficient, you know? Um, Typically when I do calibrations, I don't, I don't vary the, the microphone more than about a three foot radius from MLP. I mean, that's, yeah. I usually find the most consistent results. So if you've got a second row, that's five or six feet back. Yeah. You probably should just do a separate calibration at that point and just really focus on the main front row. You know, well, get proper. Given the fact that the um, delays are calculated for the main listening position, maybe it makes sense to have the microphone for a scenario like that. Not exactly where somebody's sitting, but just kind yeah. of in the average position of where, where they're all sitting. Sure. Someone's saying here you can average the trims for as many listening positions as you've taken. Um, I don't recall seeing that option in Odyssey where it would average the trims for multiple mic positions. Is that true? Average the trims. I'm not sure if he's saying what he means there. Um, the the trim under settings and features. Are you talking about in multi QX? I'm assuming he means that. Yeah. Is this what he's talking about, or is this what he's talking about? Enable precise trims, or because I can explain what both of those are. Yeah. Why don't you go over that anyway? What does okay. that mean? Enable precise yeah. trims. Um, enable precise trims is, um, it's a compensation for the fact that Denon and Marantz force you to round your DBs to half DB increments on the trim menu. Yes. Um, and, um, if you're, uh, an obsessive compulsive person like I am, then that's annoying. <laughs> So what we actually can do with, if you enable that checkbox, enable precise trims is get closer to the actual value. Like let's say it's 0.7. So we'll set the trim at 0.5 and then the remaining 0.2 will be added by the filter itself. And so then you'll have the exact value that you, you know, that Odyssey has determined is going to be the perfect, achieve the perfect reference level for that particular speaker. I got you. Now, if you want to check your work and make sure all your trims are balanced, you don't want to use the internal test tones of the AVR because that bypasses Odyssey altogether when you do the pink noise. Correct. Um, the best way to do that is that Dolby, Dolby has a demo disc that will let you sweep uh, limited pink noise to every channel, including the heights. And also Spears and Munsell's has a disc too that it, their new calibration disc that just came out will do, I think, up to 15 channels of uh pink noise and it's important to use um 
limited pink noise, not broadband when you're doing level setting. Like you were saying, I think the range you said was 500 hertz to five kilohertz. I usually see no, 300 hertz. Yeah, five. Yeah. So that's that's the T. There, there's different specifications. The THX specification, which is what we use, because one of our founders uh, was the founder Thomas of Holman. Yep. Right. Um, he he his system is 500 to 2K. So that's what you'll get in um, like an IMAX theater because IMAX uses Odyssey. Um, yeah. That's how they do it there. Um, and then the subwoofers are 30 to 80. So if you're if you're calibrating for the level, yes, you need to. It needs to go. It's so basically you're cutting out all the other frequencies or or uh, drastically reducing them outside of that range in order to truly get the perceptual level because that's what it's yeah. based on. It's the yeah. perceptual level. So here's here's the solution that I knew basically, and this is a good point. If you want to have different calibrations based on different positions, push each calibration set captured as a different file to a different preset on the AVR. I think the uh, they give you what three presets, two or three presets. New ones three. give you three. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, you know, that's the that's the solution, right? And that is. Where do you do that in the? Where do you do that in the software? Where's that step to to load it into preset one or preset two? Um, so in the software, you know, I think that it, it has to be, um, well, let me see, I haven't connected to one of the newer AVRs in such a long time, but I, in the older AVRs, you handle it by, it's just called the reference and the flat curve. So whichever one you're sending it to is the one that you're going to select, um, to, to get that result. Um, let's see, where is the, yeah, right here. Um, so this is, this basically uh, determines where you, uh, which of those two presets you send it to. Okay. I mean, I, you know, I'll, I'll try to go over this when I do the calibration to see where those preset numbers are assigned yeah. in the PC software. Um, I, I'm, I feel like I remember that when I was doing the numerance in our office that the software. Here we go. It's the very last step. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. It, it will ask you. Thank yeah. You. So, you know, one feature I would really like to see, and, and I would imagine if we have any pro calibrators on right now, is in most cases when someone sets up a, a theater system for a client, the AVR is not always in the same room as the display and speakers. Right. So it would be really slick if you were able to plug the mic directly into your laptop since you're already using the PC software and right. just do the measurements from there rather than running a long tethered cable from the AVR. In my case, my separate my AV10 is upstairs and my family room is downstairs. So I have to run, luckily this comes with a lot of cable. I have to run this thing down the flight of steps in order to reach my seats. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just going to go ahead and tell your viewers. And I think this is the first time that I've said it publicly that um, we have started talking to Denon and Marantz about adding that feature. Um, and that's, that's a feature that's a little bit more complicated than the ones that I've talked to, I talked about today, because the ones I've talked about today are just things we can do to update the software, right? I mean, just, we just, you know, and then we push out a new version, but like I said, you know, earlier when we were talking, their lead time is, you know, years ahead and mm -hmm. it, it's going to require firmware changes for them. So, you know, it's, I can't say that it's going to happen tomorrow, um, but uh, it's definitely something that everybody wants. Sure. And, and the, you know, there, the, the workaround solution for now is that, well, there's two workarounds, I guess. Yes, it will support the U-Mic because it doesn't matter what mic you have at that point, right? It just, you, you're plugging it into the PC and you're loading a calibration file. Um, so you could actually use any USB calibrated mic that has a file associated with it. That oh, work. that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so anyway, the workarounds that I was going to say for your users who know about um, the Pro Kit um, that you were showing, um, that will let you go very long, um, but it's $550. Yeah. Um, and then, so this, the second workaround, which I saw one of your users commenting about, um, is that you can actually do a lot of stuff in Room EQ Wizard, and that will accept the U mic as an input. Um, and then you, you go to this particular um, option right here, and this will allow you to bring those filters from Room EQ Wizard into uh, Multi QX, and then you can transfer them using Multi QX. So, because Room EQ Wizard, you know, supports the U mic so well, um, then now you you don't necessarily have to have a mic connected to the AVR anymore. But that's like I would call that super advanced, frankly. Yeah, that you know is really I mean? advanced. Yeah.
Uh, you know, one question I have for you, is it possible to F, I would assume you have to run Odyssey in order to get any access to the PEQ filter adjustments, right? You'd have to run at least one mic position. That way it does all your levels and delays and it sets up some type of a, ref, a reference curve. Can you disable everything Odyssey is doing other than level and delay and then go manually do PEQ if you want to just adjust each speaker the old fashioned way? Yes, um, that is actually a very simple thing to do because what you would do is you would take measurements, which results in, cal in the calculations. And then what you can do is click on this button right here, exclude position. Now you basically don't have any measurements, but it, but it set everything else up for you. So you can completely ignore, and you can even uh, on certain AVRs, you can exclude one by one. So you could take center measurements, but exclude your fronts, et cetera. Oh, okay. Um, that's a pretty nice feature. And it's actually interesting because um, when I was messing around with uh, Duroc, uh, I noticed that they uh, don't set the um, crossovers for you. And they don't set, you have to figure that out by yourself. And they also don't set the distances on an absolute basis. They set the distances relative to the speakers. But I think what I noticed, and maybe Gene, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that the subwoofer is always set to zero, and then all of the other speakers are um, calibrated re relative to that, which is not correct. So oh. you know it might be worthwhile for people, even if they like to rock better, which I hope that they don't. But if they do, they can yeah. still want to see first to figure out the crossovers and the absolute distances, record those, um, you know, and then um, maybe overwrite them later. Or actually, the crossovers don't get overwritten, so they can set them using odyssey and then they'll just stay the same um but uh yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't have a lot of experience yet this is the first time i have direct that i'm going to be i'm actually setting it up on the av10 and i have direct art on my storm processor which is the latest uh, version of it so this is going to be a whole learning experience for the next couple of months that i'm looking forward to yeah. um so speaking about crossover settings sometimes what happens with any room correction in an odyssey is, is an example is if a speaker is too close to a boundary, like let's say a surround side channel or a surround back channel, it often sets the speaker large because of that boundary compensate, the boundary yeah. gain you're getting from that surface. Where do you go in um, if, let's say it set my surround speaker to large or set it to 60 Hertz and I want to adjust that. Do I adjust that in this software or do I go back into the AVR and change the base management there? Uh, no, all those things can be adjusted in the software. Um, basically you have your, low frequency limit, your high frequency limit for filtering, and then you can go into the calibration settings and further adjust. You can turn these things off. So you can address the trims manually, the distances manually, and then the base management manually. So all these, the, all those things are configurable on this page. Obviously, you know, I would recommend that people do a, as automatic a calibration um, as possible the first time, you know, um, yeah evaluate how that sounds and then go back and make adjustments to that later. Um, but this is basically where you can control all that stuff. So if I change the base management settings, the crossover settings, is it going to keep the filters the way they were already calculated or is it going to shift? No, it will change things based on how you set things. Uh, the filters are always recalculated. So okay. yeah. And, and I think that's a good thing um, for most people. So, you know, if you, I don't you know, well, so I should say that's true, but it will not, if you adjust the trims and you adjust the distances, then it's not going to recalculate anything. Right. So those yeah. are just kind of like absolute settings. Um, but uh, yeah, everything else is configurable to adjust the filters and uh, let's see, do we want to go over anything else? Um, well, I have another question for you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. One thing I really like about Anthem Arc Genesis room correction is you could do real time measurements in the software. So you don't have to go and open REW. So you could go yeah. and actually measure what Arc is do. You can measure your response and then go make adjustments without having to go into do two different software uh, suites, which saves time for calibration. Absolutely. Is that something, is so that something that, you guys can do? It's something that we have to rely on. It's another one of the things that we have to rely on Denon and Marantz to fix, you know, kind of at the firmware level. Um, because exactly as we were talking about before, um, when you go into the levels menu on the AVR and you're listening to that pink noise, um, that is not Odyssey's 
uh, pink noise, right? So it's your, that's the wrong, you, what you need is the pink noise coming out of the system to be the calibrated pink noise in order to make fine tuning adjustments, but it's not. So you, that's kind of useless, you know, to, to Odyssey to, or to MultiQX, I should say. So what would need to happen is some kind of option in the AVR menu that plays pink noise that's coming through the Odyssey filtering. Um, yes. And once that happens and once they can uh, allow us to do that, then yes, absolutely, what, what you're talking about will be possible. Okay. So someone here saying the tilt feature actually helped them greatly. I would highly recommend discussing it. We kind of went over that with the disabling the auto leveling, or they mean a separate tilt feature for that. Um, yeah, so I think he's just talking about the fact that there is a target. Let me get rid of all the stuff here. Um, so now we have a clean slate. Um, I think he's just talking about this feature, which is you know, kind gotcha. of just, it's like a, it's, it's what people seem to like. It's kind of a warmer sound. Yeah. And, um, you know, Duroc is doing that a little bit. Um, they are, they seem to by default tilt down uh, at the higher frequencies a few dB. And I, I will admit that I personally do like the way that that sounds a little bit better. And I have that on one of my AVRs. Um, and, uh, you know, another, so you can, you can do kind of like neat customized type of stuff. So you can do that tilt. And then what I can also do is go in and add, um, let's do a low shelf. So now you're kind of like, that's a very, um, kind of common curve that people want to target to these days, which with mm -hmm. a little bit of a drop to the high frequencies and then a little bit more of a significant rise in the base. Uh, that's what Duroc does by default. Um, yep. So, you know, you can easily do that here and you can tweak it to your heart's content. And uh, I think it's important to note that this is really subjective and what your preference yes. is. It depends on your room dynamic. And this is something I want to do at a, a live stream with Matthew Pose when he's available. Um, I notice and he noticed as well that if you have really depends on what kind of flooring you have. If you're on a second floor and you have rafters and you feel the tactile energy in your room, or you specifically designed a floor that's floating from the rest of the house and it gives you more tactile energy, then that low end um, tilt doesn't need to be as high as it does if you have a concrete floor where you don't get the tactile energy from the base. So it really, and it really depends on your room dynamic, just how the base plays into the room where you would set that. Yeah, I mean, Art versus science, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there, people will sometimes contact our support desk and say, here's my multi-QX calibration file because we're able to open it on our, on our end and see what the user measured and see what um, you know uh, filters they added and stuff like that. And it's like, well, I don't really see any technical problems, but you know, we can't listen to it. And it's so important to just listen to it, see how it sounds. Do you like it? You know what I mean? Um, it's kind of like half the battle. You know, it's, 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 you would be lost without just saying, you know, I'm going to sit here and listen to it for a while and see how I like it. Listen to music, listen to movies. It's super important, right? Yep. Yeah. So it's cool that you're offering all these features um, to really customize the sound for what people want. I, I, you know, we didn't talk about this, but there's also a skirt feature. You might want to just show it for completeness where you don't have to correct all the way to 20K. Personally, yeah. I don't like correcting all the way to 20K. If anything, when it comes to high frequencies, I like to either add a tilt or a shelve rather than precise yeah. PEQ, especially if you have good speakers. You've got good speakers already. A microphone's not going to do a great job of trying to overcompensate for very high frequencies. Yeah, it's so hard for it to, to decipher. As I was just, so you can either type in as I was doing or you can drag the anchor as I was doing. So. So if I do that, if I limit it to, let's say, 5 kilohertz, can I go in and then add a tilt to the high frequencies manually on top of that? With Well, so this is going to disable all filtering um, for that range. So I think no is the answer to that question. Um, but what I believe you can do is... No, 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 no. You can't do that. So yeah, I think that this is going to disable... I, this is something I have to ask engineering about, but I believe... Um, oh, no. That's what it was. That's what I was thinking in the back of my head. So yes, you can limit what's only the measured stuff and then still apply your other curves. Oh, that's so, awesome. So what you what you are saying, Gene, is correct, that you are able to do that. Yeah. 
So what I would do if it was my system and you have really linear speakers, like in my example, I'm using Paralisten, which are exceptional speakers. I would limit the correction to one, maybe five kilohertz max. And then I would go and manually do the tilt or do the boost or the cuts at very high frequencies on a case by case basis for each speaker. It was another comment. I used to limit how far EQ as well, but by default, Odyssey setting killed the upper end. Getting rid of the reference curve is going to going with the tilt help the sound. Yeah, so the reference curve really does kind of squash the highs. I mean, it was designed for the cinematic days, like almost like a cinema REQ, right? I mean, it was to compensate. It was basically to compensate for mixes that were overly bright that were done in the theatrical setting. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, I mean, you can just get rid of that completely if you want to. I, again, I'm very sensitive to high frequencies. I don't like the way that the flat curve sounds at all. I, I like the roll off at the higher frequencies. Um, but, you know. It also depends on your speakers. If you're running speakers True. that have a, a very high energetic top end, yeah. reference might be the right setting for you at that point. Yeah. Well, cool, Eric. I appreciate um you going over all this stuff with us. I think the last question someone was asking, and I think we talked about this already, where can you, can you average the trims from multiple locations? I think the answer is no. You would just have to have separate calibrations at that point. So if you want to have an average between, let's say, two rows, you might want to just set the microphone three feet back, two or three feet back from the front row. And yeah. that'll give you kind of an average. I mean, you sound falls off theoretically 6 dB for every doubling of distance, but that's anechoic. When you're in a real room, it's more like 4 dB. So if you want to just set it, I, what I do is when I set up, I actually calibrate as if the seat is inclined because I incline my seat anyway. And that puts it back an extra two feet or so. And that's where I set the mic position. And it gets it closer to that back row so it doesn't have to boost the back ch channels as much, right? Because typically your back row is really close to those back surrounds. So I kind of neuter those speakers just a little bit because I don't want people in the back row being blown away by those channels. Yeah, and I'm not sure you necessarily want to have trims averaged in a different location than the filters are averaged. I, I need to think about that some more, but intuitively it doesn't really make sense to me because you kind of want to have the trims and the filters be in sync. Um, but, uh, you know, like anything else, it, it's, uh, there's a lot of personal preference that comes into play. So, so I didn't know this, the last screen, you can average the levels based on all the measurements. The last screen, meaning the calibration settings. I'm not sure what, uh, huh. Maybe he can clarify what he means there. Yeah, I don't know either. Like I said, I'm, this is all kind of a learning curve. I've never used 1.5 yet. So I'm going to be, you can average them. Someone's claiming you can average them. Okay. Well, I'll look at that. I mean, if you don't know the answer now, um, I'll look at that when I'm doing my calibration next week. Sure. Set auto trim distance. <laughs> Aaron. Aaron's funny. Nice. I mean, I, ha I have to kind of agree with Aaron. I mean, I've had I've had mixed bag results with Odyssey in the past. The PC software is really a game changer for anyone that um, wants to really tweak out the sound. And I always tell people when you want to compare room correction, not just Odyssey, any room correction to what it's doing, if it's beneficial, it's much better to compare it with just two speakers playing because what happens when you have multiple, let's say you have 11 speakers or 16 speakers in a room, there's too much of a masking effect and it's very hard to decipher if you really prefer something when you've got multiple sources of sound coming at you at once. So I say listen to two channel music. In fact, when Chris Kariakakis used to come to my place years ago, he used to have a James Taylor reference disc and it was whatever song it was from James Taylor, it had really precise imaging from the Phantom Center that you would hear from the recording and you would compare with Odyssey on and off to see if you liked the results. Sometimes what happened when, when Odyssey overcompensated is it created a really strong Phantom Center. It actually sounded unnatural. 
So you had to dial things back a little bit to get the staging, the sound staging right. So it's really, like I said, it's really important to listen to music, listen to two channel music uh, when you're making these adjustments, get that right first. And then obviously get all the speakers playing and make sure everything is properly level matched and you're not over EQing and you like the end result. Yeah, and you know, unfortunately, um, a discussion that you've probably had before, Gene, um, that I have with my colleagues a lot is that there is sort of a standard for mixing for movies, um, but there is not really a standard for mixing for music. And so um, a common thing that we've seen is that people have different presets for music uh, versus movies. Music tends to have the movies do tend to have kind of a more subdued high end compared to music, especially these days. Um, so I'll, I'll be watching a movie and I'll think to myself, eh, it's kind of, it's a little bit dull, needs a little bit more in the upper range. But uh, then I listen to music and I think, oh, these, uh, this, the hi-hats or the, uh, the, the acoustic guitar sounds are a little bit too high and scratchy for me. So, um, you know, it's maybe that's a solution to um, have a better listening experience in both scenarios is to have one preset for music, one preset for movies. But that being said, I don't know. Most people probably are not listening to music in their home theater if they have a custom home theater per se. So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe that's more important. My home theater, or I should say my uh, stereo is in my living room and I use it both for uh, watching TV as well as just kind of listening to ambient music. So I make my adjust. I don't, and I hate going into the menu and switching back and forth. So I do my adjustments based on what's going to give me the kind of the overall nicest sound for all this. Yeah. I'm kind of like that too. I hate doing that. But what you could do instead of use instead of using up a preset for that, you could have a reference curve and a flat curve or you could relabel those, right? If you, yes. can you relabel the names of those curves? Yes, but what I'm saying is that I don't even want to go, I don't want to think about that when I'm just turning the stereo on. Like, I don't want to have to go in and toggle them back and forth. Like, I, I'm usually on my iPhone. I'm using yeah. AirPlay or something like that. I'm not even standing near the remote or the AVR itself. I just want music to come on. So, you know, it's something that I don't really want to have to think about. Yeah, I got you. Well, you have the flexibility to do, basically customize your sound however you like it. Yes, yeah. So. But if you're but if you're in a if you're in a home theater, I would say you know it's probably it, it is important to listen to music in a stereo way to kind of get that initial feeling for the way that the calibration is gone. But you know you definitely don't want to undervalue the at least the five point one experience. You want to make sure that the dialogue is clear and all that stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah, definitely check your center channel dialogue intelligibility. Even if you turn up, you could turn off all the other channels. That would yeah. be a cool feature to add. And I don't know, you would have to work with Denon and Marantz, but it would be cool to be able to turn off channels and then just listen to one channel at a time. You know? Yeah. Yeah, you're Otherwise, right. Otherwise, in most AVRs, like in the Storm processor, I could just turn on and off channels in the software. It's easy as pie. Mm -hmm. But in, in a Denon or Marantz receiver, you have to physically go behind the speaker and turn it off. So... It right. would be cool if you could do that here. Yeah, that would be Turn cool. Turn the channels on and off, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Maybe that's 1.6 that we get all these features. Yeah, and you know what? I do want to, I don't know, we, I guess we have two minutes. Is that, can I sure, talk about sure. other things? So we are, uh, I want to talk about some upcoming features just to get some uh, some excitement uh, among your users brewing for that. We're adding um, a new screen that's going to allow you to experiment with what the best crossover setting is. Um, and it's going to use a, some nice algorithmic type stuff to try to help you decide that. But then you're also going to be able to see the results and pick the crossovers uh, that work better for you. And that's going to be kind of a neat feature, I think. Um, you mean it's going to and it's going to look at the integration between the LCRs and the subs? Exactly. It's going to it's going to analyze everything and tell you this is what we think is the best for you. And you know this is what's what happens if you don't like that and choose this one instead. This is what the graph is going to look like. So that should be a pretty cool new feature. Um, and we're also in response to user demand going to be adding, um, something that has been asked for actually for, I think the entire existence of the app, which is the ability to import target curves. So you can't currently create a target curve and then move it to your next calibration. So you'll be able to create a target curve either in multi QX and save that to its own file, or maybe even create a target curve in Rumi Q wizard have it be in its own file. And then you can easily import that into multi QX for all of the calibrations that you do. And you can get that kind of, you know, the tilt and the low shelf that you want or whatever. Uh, that's something that people have been asking for. 
So we are, we're working on those two things. Very cool. Very cool. Well, Eric, I appreciate you going over all these new features of, of version 1.5. I want to lastly talk about the microphone. So, so when you buy a Denon or Marantz product, it comes with the standard uh, microphone. You guys have seen this. You know, you open it up. It's the, I'll show what people, what it looks like. You can tell I haven't ran it yet because it's still in the bag. So this is the standard microphone for anyone that is familiar with running Odyssey. But then you have the ability, and I think you could buy it on Amazon if I'm not mistaken, the ACM-1X. Correct. Basically, it's the same microphone, but it's better calibrated. Maybe can you give us a one-minute spiel on what that is? Hand calibrated individually by an actual physical human person um, in our anechoic chamber in our office. Um, we use a tone generator, and then we record the results through the mic into a file, which precisely compensates for any deviances from zero, uh, from zero dB. And then that file is stored on our server. When you go into MultiQX and you put in the serial number of the exact mic that you ordered on Amazon, it will download the calibration file that is just for you. And will probably get you one to two dB more accuracy across the entire frequency range uh, for your calibration. So definitely worthwhile if the, that kind of um, you know difference makes a, a difference to you. Um, for me, I can easily hear the difference between zero and two dB. So yes, I, I want that and I think it's worth the money. Um, but that being said, the, the default mic is still pretty good and will work well for most people. So, and you could reuse this mic if you buy this mic and you get it and you upgrade your Marantz or Denon receiver. Like you said, you go into the software, you enter the serial number and it downloads the calibration file for it. Right. So yeah. it's definitely a worthwhile um, cost. And I'll put this, I'll put some links to Amazon in the description. And then of course we got the pro calibration kit. I'll show one more time. Yep. This is what I'll be using when I do my uh, calibration. Yeah. And it comes with a mic stand. It comes with lots of cables. It comes with a mic preamp and it comes with a very precise microphone. Yeah. That's also available um, through our website and uh, it's quite a bit more expensive, but it's also quite a bit more rugged. And as we've said before, it can be extended to much longer. The, the, the ACM one X only has a 25 foot cable. So that yes. you can extend the cable just by buying more XL mini XLR cables. You can extend the cable length of the uh, pro kit up to I think it's thousands of feet, actually. Uh, <laughs> so if you want to calibrate, you know, an arena <laughs> or something like that, um, you can use that mic. Um, yeah, because you have a mic preamp that it will compensate for the losses in the cable. So that, that's yeah. that's really that's really essential when you think about it. The the Denon or the Marantz receiver doesn't have that kind of a drive to add more extension right. cable. I think you could add like another 25 feet of extension cable to one of these mics and still be okay, right? Yeah, it's it's iffy. We've uh, experienced mix res mixed results when trying to do that because the difference between 25 and 50 feet is pretty significant, but uh, I've never gotten it to work very well. Unfortunately, it's just the preamp that they have in there, you know, and it's probably not worth it for them to upgrade that preamp considering sure. that they have these new options. So especially the the wireless option that Duroc has and that we're working on. So, you know, it doesn't quite make sense for them to pass that cost on to the users. I gotcha. Yeah. We've got a super chat here from Mark, MultiQX and ACM1X among the best purchases I made for my system. Highly recommended. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that super chat and great feedback there. And then last comment here, one to two dB is more different than you think. Look at what the headroom expansion is doing. Not using the mic is getting the extra automatically. Yeah, that's a good point. Awesome. You got a lot of fans here, Eric. I'm very happy. <laughs> well, I appreciate you coming on here, Eric, and we'll definitely have you back um, in the future when you have more updates. And guys, I'm going to be doing a very extensive video on my post calibration results with Odyssey MultiQX, and I'm also going to be comparing it to Dirac. So you guys definitely want to check that out and see um, how these things work. Appreciate you guys watching today. Hit the thumbs up if you like this video. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to me if you want to suggest video topics or ask questions. And until next time, my friends, keep listening. <laughs>